Um, do you see me? It's a pleasure to um, welcome Dr. Jonathan Horton, who is William F. Hoyt Professor of Ophthalmology at University of California, San Francisco, one of the foremost experts and the physician scientist in um, ophthalmology in the visual neurosciences. And um, probably a lot of people in Pino and Fine already know him and already heard him because I think he was already there in Colombia in a couple of years ago and he also visited uh, one of the Fine meetings. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him back. Um, Dr. Horton, it's, uh, stage is yours. Thank you so much for the chance to speak this morning. The talks that have been given have focused mainly on eye movements. And of course, the purpose of eye movements is to allow us to perceive what is in our visual environment. All of us are curious about how it is that the brain enables us to perceive visual scenes, to identify people, and to guide our behavior through visual input. In the next half an hour, I'm going to summarize some of the work that's been done in the field, giving us insights into this process. I'm going to lean heavily on the work of uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who played such an important role in the exploration of the visual system that they conducted in their years of collaboration together. I had the chance to work in this very laboratory shown here in this picture. And uh, I'm going to try to give you a bit of the flavor of what they contributed and others subsequently to the solution of this problem, a solution which still ultimately eludes us. If one records from retinal ganglion cells and characterizes their receptive field organization, one discovers that the fields are constructed as shown in this schematic diagram. These are recordings from a retinal ganglion cell and in the dark, it fires away with a certain spontaneous rate. For on-center cells, a light confined to the receptive field center, when turned on, excites an increase in the rate of action potential discharge rate. When the light is made larger than the field center, the response is reduced as if surrounding the center, there is an inhibitory zone which antagonizes the response generated by light in the center of the visual field. And indeed, one can prove this by using an annulus of light, which when turned on, suppresses the cell completely. There are two types of center surround cells in the primate visual system. On center cells, as shown here, which are excited by light on their receptive field center, and off center cells, which are excited by darkness on the center of the receptive field. Ganglion cell output involved in visual perception projects to the lateral geniculate body, a thalamic relay station, where the cells have a very similar receptive field organization. There's some important differences in the receptive field properties of geniculate cells, but their fundamental receptive field organization is the same. Which is Sorry to bother you, Dr. Horton. We, yeah. we are having a hard time hearing you. Um, Thank you, Olivia. Let, let me see if I can boost my uh, microphone. Just a minute. It kind of comes and goes away. It kind of pulls the tile. I see. I'm not sure of the reason for that. Let me... Uh, um, find the uh, control over the microphone. Manasi, do you have any input how, uh, for this issue? I'm groping here. This is the, much better. This is this much better. better. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, then I clicked on the correct button then. And really? another, 
about this? Is this even better? This is yeah. good. This is good. Yes. Okay. We'll go with this then. Thank you. Shall I start from the beginning again? Uh, uh, the, um, uh, Thornton, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm joking. I think not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the cells in the uh, lateral genetic body then project to the cortex. And in the cortex, one finds a dramatic transformation in receptive field properties. The cells in the cortex have orientation tuning. So for example, if the receptive field corresponds to this gray shaded zone, a light that is oriented like this excites the cell to fire. When it turns on, there's a burst of action potentials. And one can plot in simple cells zones where light excites or light suppresses. The important point is that when the light stimulus is presented at the wrong orientation, the cell is not excited to fire. So going from the genicle to the cortex, there's a transformation from center surround to oriented receptive fields. Hubel and Wiesel came up with this simple but brilliant hypothesis for how this orientation specificity might be generated. Imagine a cortical cell here that gets input from four lateral geniculate body cells. And imagine that these lateral geniculate body cells have their receptive fields located as shown here. If a light is presented to these receptive fields at this orientation, extending from about two o'clock to eight o'clock, if the bar of light is the right width and lands on all the field centers, it will excite all four geniculate neurons at once. To be sure, this bar of light also falls on the inhibitory surrounds of these geniculate cells, but it falls upon 100% of the receptive field centers and only about 20 or 30% of the receptive field surrounds. If for a given geniculate cell, the field center and surround are each weighted about equally, this will be a strongly excitatory stimulus. The geniculate cells will all fire simultaneously, generating EPSPs in this cortical neuron, which will sum to threshold and cause the cortical neuron to fire. Now imagine if the light bar is presented at the wrong orientation, say like this. It'll then land only on one geniculate cell receptive field center. It'll fail to activate these cells and the firing of a single geniculate cell won't be enough to bring the cortical cell to threshold. I'm going to play you next a videotape showing Hubel and Wiesel recording from one of these oriented cortical cells. Can you hear the audio? Yes. Good. The, uh, not the vid, not the not of the video. We just hear you. Sorry. How we do? Now it's good. This is the only thing that's interesting. Here you 
stimulate the same receptors in the eye and the same cells, but this particular cortical cell can only see a function of this orientation. So that's now, just to, to, just to show you how it works, as they said, when you put the brush, the paintbrush that I caused. So um, imagine that a subject is looking at an image like this. What will this image generate in the primary visual cortex? Well, all the receptive fields located at luminance borders with orientation tuning that corresponds to the orientation of the luminance border will be excited to respond. And so there will be a constellation of cells in the primary visual cortex with their receptive fields as shown here on this image, which will all fire simultaneously. And if somehow the output from those cells could be brought to converge upon some sort of higher order neuron that combined these inputs, that neuron would then be tuned to the recognition of, of a face, as in this case. So after the discovery of the primary visual cortex, investigators began to probe for these sort of higher order cells um, sometimes called grandmother cells that would serve this function of deciphering the input sent to them from early cortical visual areas such as the primary visual cortex. As you know, the primary visual cortex constitutes only a small portion of the entire visual cortex, although it is in fact the largest single cortical area in the primate brain. Here you see the right occipital lobe from a subject removed at autopsy. Here is the cochrane fissure. This is the prior occipital sulcus. And I have carved out from the banks of the cochrane fissure the tissue that corresponds to the primary visual cortex. So what is all this additional visual cortex doing? An idea that's been around for more than 100 years is that different areas in these so-called extra striate regions could be specialized for different functional duties, a kind of division of labor theory whereby there might be a region that processes color, another one that recognizes people, another that recognizes places, another center for ocular movements and so forth and so on. Given this idea, it would be natural then to search for anatomical boundaries that might correspond to these putative areas. The boundary of the primary visual cortex is very easy to recognize because of the stria of Gennari. Early neuroanatomists looked in the occipital parietotemporal lobes for other tissue boundaries that might correspond to these different proposed visual areas. And of course, the most famous of all of these neuroanatomists was Brodmann, who looked in the occipital lobe and recognized what he called area 17, which corresponded to the primary visual cortex, and then two additional areas, which he referred to as area 18 and 19. The disappointing thing is that using conventional histological methods, one cannot reliably differentiate more than a few different visual areas in the back portion of the brain where visual processing occurs. It has taken more modern techniques combining electrophysiology, axon tracing, cytochemical studies, immunohistochemical studies and other methods to show that there indeed are a large number of different areas 
in this visual cortex. This is one of the most famous depictions of this parcellation. It's from the work of Fellman and Van Essen. It's a review article. And even though it identifies as coded here in color, many, many different visual areas or areas that are involved in visual processing in addition to other functions, this is probably a very incomplete and primitive, relatively early rendition of how this tissue is partitioned and specialized. Well, you see here V1, the primary visual cortex, V2, the next visual area, V3, and then this area here, coded in blue, which is called V4, and has been regarded by many as the entry portal to the infrotemporal lobe, where it appears much of imaging perception and processing takes place. In accordance with this concept of functional specialization of different areas, Semir Zeki made recordings in this region and described an unusual property, namely the fact that all the receptive fields he encountered were specific for the color of the stimuli used to drive the cell. Here you see an electro penetration going into V4, and this is the sequence of receptive fields encountered for the 13 neurons he recorded. And in every one, the color scheme was vital for driving the cell effectively. This was such a prominent feature in this region of cortex that he described this as the color area. This generated a great deal of controversy and many follow-up studies trying to elucidate whether or not, in fact, V4 is the color area in the primate brain. Whether or not that specific claim turns out to be true, it is very clear that there is a region in the human visual cortex which is specialized for the perception of color. And when that area is damaged, color perception is abolished, and it is for the subject as if they are looking at the world in black and white. I want to just show you an example of a patient who suffered a stroke involving the color area. It's this area down here in the fusiform gyrus in the underside of the human brain. So here's the calcarin fissure with the primary visual cortex, and this is the region that's damaged in subjects who have this phenomenon of cerebral achromatopsia. This is an axial MRI scan from a man who suffered a stroke in his right color area. You can see here the bright signal in this image corresponding to this cerebral vascular accident. Now this stroke also involved the optic radiations feeding the lower bank of the Cochrane fissure, which corresponds to the upper left field of vision. So this patient had an absolute scotoma in the upper left quadrant, and he also had achromatopsia in the left lower quadrant. And I'll pay you a videotape next showing you at the bedside how we tested this patient. I'm sorry to hear that you had a stroke last week, which has affected your vision. I'd like to just test your vision to uh, ascertain how it's been uh, affected. First, though, just uh, to make one point, um, what uh, happened to your left eye? When I was ten, I got hit by a baseball and lost the right eye and got hit the left eye. So that's why there's a slight asymmetry in the appearance of the two eyes. So you're just looking at me through your right eye, aren't you? Okay. All right. All right camera now and we're going to go ahead and test the visual fields and I'd like you just to say yes uh, as soon as you uh, see the hand, okay? okay. Now? Yes. 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 Yes.
All right, and let's go ahead and test color vision now. Look right at my camera. Great. Any trouble recognizing your friends, Mr. Olson? And uh, have you noticed anything wrong with your color vision? No, you pointed it out today. Okay. Thanks for letting us uh, take this movie. We appreciate it very much. Bye bye now. So uh, the interesting point is that um, in addition to achromatopsia, patients with lesions in this area suffer a problem recognizing faces. And at first glance, that's a, a, a puzzling association because of course you have no trouble recognizing familiar faces when you see a black and white photograph. So why should impairment of color vision lead to or be associated with the difficulty recognizing faces? This area here, which I referred to as the color region, is in other uh, textbooks referred to as the facial recognition area because these two areas seem to involve the same zone of tissue. And if in fact this tissue is involved in two such disparate functions, it would seem to contradict the idea of parcellation of the cortex into distinct areas that serve different functions. This has been a, a, a conundrum for many years, one that's been addressed in a very interesting way by some experiments done by Brian Wandell, using fMRI to map regions of the brain that are activated by the challenge of recognizing faces or being stimulated with colors. What he did was to present faces alternating with epics where he presented color using these isoluminant color stimuli, which came on periodically. Looking at the cortex, the activation occurred in the fusiform gyrus area as shown here. This is a ventral view of the human hemisphere. Here's the tip of the temporal lobe. This is the fusiform gyrus. And here he has flattened out the cortex so that you can see where the bold response was localized. What you intermingled as sort of patches of cortex. It appears that yes, color sensitive cells and face sensitive cells do share the same general location but rather than being discrete areas with tidy boundaries, as shown in the anatomical diagrams that I presented to you earlier, in these extra striate regions, the cells are located in clusters or patches with very ill-defined borders, and they share the same general cortical address, but the networks of cells doing this processing are distinct. That means it's going to be much more of a challenge than we ever realized to map how different functions are localized in extra strike cortical regions. And it'll be particularly difficult because often cells will overlap spatially, but be dedicated to entirely different functions. So what have we learned from the physiology? Single cell recordings have been done in macaques 
And they've confirmed the idea that there are patches of cells that are dedicated to the processing of faces. This field was broken open with the work of Charlie Gross and his colleagues at Princeton University. This shows the temporal lobe of the macaque monkey with these dots here representing individual electrode penetrations. They made the remarkable observation that there are higher order cells in the temporal lobe of the monkey, just as one might have predicted, which are able to take input from lower cortical visual areas and synthesize that input so that the cells respond in highly specific ways to the appearance of faces. This is a cell which responded both to monkey faces and to human faces. And one knows that the response is specific to the fact that this is a face rather than to the particular image statistics that this pattern of contours and contrast has, because when you scramble the face like this, you no longer get a response. Or when you present some other body part like a hand, you no longer get a response. So this is a very specific response to faces. And it seems amazing that there could exist cells that have such precise tuning in the primate brain. But remember, the recognition of faces is one of the most important and subtle discriminations that we make as social creatures, as primates. There have been some recordings in the human brain that have confirmed the existence of such highly specific faces, face selectivity, and even more selective than what this cell exhibits where there is some crosstalk between the macaque face and the human face. This is an experiment that was done by Christoph Koch, Gabriel Kreeman and colleagues recording in the hippocampus of the human in subjects just prior to epilepsy surgery. And in this experiment, subjects were shown an inventory of faces and going through that inventory, single cells were identified that responded only to the presentation of faces of certain well-known public individuals. This is an example of a cell that responded only to the presentation of the face of a particular well-known actress, and all other faces were ineffective at driving the cell. These are summary data showing 80 different images shown to this cell. In red bars, you see the responses graphed in the y-axis here as number of spikes, and it was these seven images that were effective at driving the cell. In other words, this cell is engaged directly in the recognition of individual subjects, subjects not even known personally to this particular subject, but known through television, movies, and other media. So to summarize, it appears that the outlines of faces are generated by the orientation selective cells at lower visual areas. Other features of the face are added by other cortical response properties. And then these funnel to higher order face specific regions in the human brain where the act of perceiving individuals occurs through the tuning, the exquisitely specific tuning of very small numbers, a so-called sparse coding concept, very small numbers of cells that are engaged in this perceptual experience. Well, I've covered a vast field in 30 minutes, but I hope this gives some flavor of the approach taken by individuals who are working on this problem. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the panelists? I don't see any audience question. I have, so I have a few, couple of questions at least. Okay, I'll ask my questions. <clears throat> so, um, uh, something that I, so I am a movement disorder neurologist as well. Oh, wait, one second. Uh, there is a question came up, sorry. Uh, there was one question from the audience. Let me just ask that. What about faces interracially? I believe what she's trying to ask, uh, this is Claudia Silvia. Uh, she's asking, um, 
Are there any racial differences in facial recognition? Is that what she means? I believe. Yes, that's what she means. Yeah. So um, there's no neurophysiology addressing this, but uh, there are psychophysical data showing that, yes, um, it is easier for individuals to recognize and discriminate the faces of uh, individuals within their own uh, racial group than uh, other racial groups. And um, I think that's uh, something that's widely acknowledged that it's an easier classification for us to make as individuals. Uh, so I have um, uh, this. Oscar. Sorry. Donald, some... Always this was fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, so this has something to do with being right-handed and left-handed. Uh, I, I thought that the 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 right fusiform gyrus is what you you say uh, in probably in left-handed people. Sometimes you can have that function also in the left brain uh, occasionally with lesions in, in the left fusiform gyrus causes also prosopagnosia. Is yeah, so, so there are bilateral color centers and bilateral face recognition areas. Uh, the work of Nancy Canwisher has shown that in general for right-handed individuals, interestingly, it is actually the right face recognition center that tends to be a little larger and a little bit more robust. And there are multiple face patches, but most individuals uh, have bilateral facial recognition areas um, with some bias versus right hand versus left hand, not a strong effect, but you're right, there is some bias. And of course, to truly have prosopagnosia, you must have loss of those face recognition areas on both sides of the brain. If you have loss of the face recognition on one side of the brain, you have loss of face recognition only in one hemisphere, but since you're making eye movements constantly, you bring your healthy hemisphere over to the subject of interest and still have no trouble identifying them. Great, thank you. So, um, okay, let me ask my question. So um, I also uh, often inject um, Botox for cervical dystonias and um, when I first evaluate patient with neck dystonia, um, I mean, you know, we often look out for a subtle neck tilt or neck turn, especially with the tilt, like lateral collis. Um, I have noticed since onset of COVID that when my patients are wearing masks, my sensitivity of their detect, uh, their uh, subtle lateral collis has gone down. But the moment I get the mask, I ask them to take off the mask. Um, I can pick up very subtle, uh, subtle um, lateral collis in the same person. So the question is like, I am masking half of my face. I'm just looking at person's eyes. So facial recognition is not complete here, right? So the robustness of probably, hopefully my brain is not wrong. I hope it is the physiology, but um, so the firing, of those face cells are not robust enough, but does it have any connection with the percept of verticality? Well, I'm not sure about the verticality. And of course the tilting of the head and the counter rolling of the eyes may, may to some extent nullify the effects of head tilting. Your observation about the eyes is very important because uh, as you saw in that Yarbus diagram that I started my talk with, we spend much of our time when we look at faces looking at the eyes. And so our discriminations about uh, the, the orbit and the appearance of the eyes play a very heavy role in our facial recognition mechanisms. And being able to see the eyes is a huge part of facial recognition. It contributes disproportionately to the discriminations we make when we recognize faces. But what about the mouth and the nose? Because that they all was contribute. Sure, they all they all contribute, but uh, if you if you did a surface area weighting of the face, um, the eyes have a disproportionate impact on our ability to discriminate faces. And uh, by the way, don't underestimate the hair. Hairstyles uh, generate uh, quite a bit of the um, percept of a person's face, and that's one of the reasons why um, you'll often get a lot of comments after getting a haircut because it really has a major impact on how people perceive you and recognize you when you change your hairstyle. Um, 
Yeah, you sensitive to that. <laughs> Jorge, what impact do you have when you change your hairstyle? <laughs> I don't think anybody will recognize me. You know, <laughs> I came with, with a lot of hair. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't. I don't see any other questions. Um, well, thank you very much. It was amazing lecture.